Tonight, President Vladimir Putin's first foray into the Ukrainian war zone. A secretive nighttime tour through occupied Mariupol. Mm -hmm. A bold and brazen move stirring international outrage. I think people are disgusted that Putin is traveling around occupied Ukraine. The only place he should be going is The Hague. We the people have had enough. Republicans rally behind Donald Trump. It just feels like a politically charged prosecution. As his potential arrest looms. Plus, paying the price for clean power in northern Manitoba. They purport to be a green source of energy. It's not green here. The First Nation putting the environment at the forefront. CTV National News with Sandy Ronaldo reporting tonight, John Venevalli Rao. Good evening. In another act of defiance, Vladimir Putin has made a brash appearance, setting foot on the Russian-occupied Ukrainian mainland, the closest he's been yet to the front lines. Images show the Russian president in the port city of Mariupol, which had been heavily damaged by shelling during his year-old invasion. On Saturday, he made an appearance in Crimea, and it all taking place after the International Criminal Court issued a warrant for Putin's arrest. With more, here's CTV's chief political correspondent, Glenn McGregor. After Russian bombs leveled countless homes, President Vladimir Putin came to accept thanks for building new ones. Do you like it here, he asks. Yes, it's warm and cozy, they say. Thank you. It's a small piece of heaven, she says. Putin played tourists, driving himself through the Ukrainian city of Mariupol, still in ruin from the airstrikes he ordered, and now mostly occupied by his troops. He brought Russian TV cameras with him to a local military monument and a children's playground. The sights he didn't see on this public relations tour, the mass graves filled with Mariupol's dead, and the maternity hospital heavily shelled by his troops last year, an image that horrified the world. Well, you know, they say that murder always comes back to the crime scene. This trip into newly occupied territory is the closest Putin has come to the front lines in the war he started. His message intended for a Russian audience. He's definitely trying to show his own population that he's in control, that uh, Mariupol and the Donbass are very much in Russian control. The visit comes after the International Criminal Court on Friday issued a warrant for his arrest. A turning point, Ukraine's leader says, that will hold an evil state accountable. To Volodymyr Zelensky and his supporters, Putin's photo ops on Ukrainian soil are merely propaganda. I think people are disgusted that uh, Putin is traveling around uh, occupied Ukraine, uh, flaunting uh, the rule of international law. The only place he should be going is The Hague. Uh, we should be having a jail cell there ready for him as his next stop. In fact, Putin's next stop is back in Moscow, where he'll host one of his few remaining allies. Chinese President Xi Jinping will pitch a peace plan for Ukraine, but experts expect it will do little to end the conflict. John. And that state visit to last three days. Thank you, Glenn. The war in Ukraine is likely to be on the agenda when the U.S. president meets with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in Ottawa later this week. On CTV's question period, David Cohen, the U.S. ambassador to Canada, added another possible topic for discussion, security and shared defense. I think how we fund our 21st century defense efforts in order to confront 21st century threats will be a topic of conversation. Cohen said more money for defense is needed but acknowledge Canada has stepped up its spending commitments, including support for Ukraine. There's a new development in the legal saga involving former U.S. President Donald Trump. A new witness is being called to testify before a grand jury in New York, investigating allegations he made hush money payments to an adult film star during the 2016 campaign. Trump this weekend said he expects to be arrested on Tuesday, and today Republicans are rallying to his side. Here's CTV's Richard Madden. With the unprecedented scenario of an indictment of former President Donald Trump, an American first, his potential challengers are rushing to his defense. It just feels like a politically charged prosecution here. I think it's building a lot of sympathy uh, for the former president. Over the weekend, Trump posted he'll be arrested Tuesday by New York prosecutors for his role in alleged hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels during the 2016 presidential election to hide allegations of an affair. Trump claims innocence, 
urging his supporters to protest, take our nation back. This is our Echoes of the insurrection, says Trump's former national security advisor. If he's calling people into the streets, this time he's seen the experience of January the 6th, and I think this is potentially very dangerous. That pro-Trump mob chanted, hang Mike Pence. Hang Mike Pence. Clear, we're coming out now. The former VP said it endangered his life and his family's. But now Pence is trying to walk a fine line supporting Trump's legal fight while advancing his own political ambitions. I think it's one of the reasons why the country just wants a fresh start. The grand jury will hear new witnesses Monday. Trump's legal team requesting Bob Costello, a former lawyer to star witness Michael Cohen, who has reimbursed $130,000 by Trump for paying off Daniels. No one is above the law not even the former president of the United States. If it's time to bring indictments, then they'll bring indictments. That's how our legal system works. And while Trump's spokesperson says there's been, quote, no notification of an arrest from the district attorney, Trump supporters are planning to protest in New York tomorrow. Authorities there are preparing for potential violence. John. Of course, we'll be watching that closely. Thank you, Richard. Now to the turmoil in global banking and an emergency takeover that will see Swiss banking giant UBS buy its rival Credit Suisse for around $4.5 billion Canadian. There was a scramble to reach a deal before markets opened Monday with Swiss regulators playing a key role and offering liquidity assistance. It was no longer possible to restore the necessary confidence and that a swift and stabilizing solution was absolutely Necessary. Credit Suisse has struggled with scandals and shares in the bank sold off this past week following concerns about the collapse of two U.S. banks. In Ecuador and Peru, the search for survivors continues following Saturday's disastrous earthquake. It led to the collapse of more than 300 buildings, including this museum in southern Ecuador. It detached from a dock and crumbled into the sea. In all, at least 15 people were killed and hundreds were injured. And a chaotic scene in central Bangladesh today after a tragic bus crash. At least 19 people are dead and dozens were injured. Police believe the driver lost control before the speeding bus smashed through a highway fence. It then fell 10 meters into a ditch. Road crash fatalities are a major concern in Bangladesh where some 8,000 die every year in collisions. Investigators in Montreal have recovered the body of one victim following Thursday's massive fire at a condo building. Crews are continuing the painstaking process of taking the structure apart brick by brick so they can safely get in and search for at least six other missing people. CTV's Angela McKenzie has the latest. Small crowds watch on as police and firefighters inspect the structure's charred remains from a crane as they begin the process of dismantling the historic building. We're going to take down this building slowly, uh, stone by stone, to make sure that the environment inside here is uh, safe for all the uh, people from the fire department and the police department. The fire tore through the building on Thursday. Some who escaped say they saw smoke but did not hear any fire alarms. Days later, people continue to leave flowers at this growing memorial. Among the missing, 75-year-old photographer Camille Mailleux. We didn't have any news, so we don't have proof. We still can hope. But unfortunately, uh, reality tells us that maybe she, she was still in the building. Tourists had rented apartments here through Airbnb, but the city has said the building was not authorized for short-term rentals. The building's owner did not respond to our request for comment. His lawyer told La Presse, it was his tenants, not him, who were subletting their apartments on Airbnb. In a statement, Airbnb writes, Our hearts go out to the victims of this tragedy and their families and loved ones. We are providing our support to those affected and we are assisting law enforcement as they investigate. Police have said it's too early to say if the fire was criminal. All of this work won't happen quickly. Montreal police say it could take days, if not weeks, to complete. In the meantime, family and friends continue their agonizing wait for any word on their loved ones. Angela McKenzie, CTV News, Montreal. The family of a 10-year-old girl who died in a fire on a southern Ontario First Nation is reeling from the loss.
I was just basically numb. I don't like devastated. The body of Ava Howick was found in her family's burned out trailer on the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation early Monday morning. The parents and four siblings managed to escape the flames. Family members say they are grateful for the community support they have received. Just a lot of people reaching out and sending donations. And yesterday, my one niece had delivered a whole truckload of toys and, and clothing. The Ontario Fire Marshal is still trying to pinpoint the cause of the fire. A First Nation in northern Manitoba is speaking out after watching their hunting land erode and waters change because of hydro development. And as CTV's Jill Mackishon explains, as demand for clean energy grows, so too are fears of a nasty spillover in other Indigenous communities. If you follow the power grid north, the rivers and generating stations, at the beginning of that pathway is Norway House Cree Nation, a community which has relied on the water surrounding it for centuries and is starting to see changes. That water so dirty and it, it affected the fishing, the trapping. An engineering study commissioned by the First Nation shows the land is eroding near channels cut decades ago by Manitoba Hydro to increase water flow. More silt is being dumped into the water. I just want to see a solution. Um, I'm not looking for compensation. I'm looking for a solution. In 1997, Norway House signed an implementation agreement with Manitoba Hydro and the governments of the day. A $78.9 million compensation package to the community for harms done to the land and the people. In the 26 years that have followed, the community has seen lake levels increase and water quality decrease as more dams have come online. They purport to be a green, a green source of energy, right? Green power or whatever. It's not green here in our lands. Experts say the conflicting needs of a world requiring more resources and minerals and the indigenous people who live on the land will lead to more challenges. Around 54% of mineral deposits globally were going to intersect with Indigenous or other land connected people. So it is absolutely a global problem, but it is very much a local issue for Canada as well. Um, and, and I think that we need to really prioritize it into the future. She says more Indigenous partnerships and leadership will be necessary to advance resource development. It's what the chief of Norway House is asking for too. I'm asking to fix the problem that they've created. And we we'll, we can move move on together. In a statement, Manitoba Hydro said it has added rock along the shoreline for erosion protection and advised Norway House to take its complaint to a four-party forum outlined in that 1997 agreement. Instead, the chief is appealing to the United Nations at a conference next month. John. Okay, Jill in Winnipeg tonight. Thank you. Chair Polyev made a pitch today to try and address the country's shortage of health care workers. The Conservative leader is calling for a nationwide testing standard so doctors and nurses trained in other countries can work in any province or territory. It's common sense. If you can do the job, you should get the job. If you are a doctor, you shouldn't be driving a taxi. You should have the chance to care for kids who are in great need. Under the proposed Blue Seal program, health care professionals would get their test results within 60 days. Currently, the licensing process to practice medicine is up to each province and territory. Coming up, a sunken reminder of a bloody war. 20 years since America invaded Iraq. Plus, explaining the strange shooting stars above California. Today marks the 20th anniversary of the dramatic opening salvo in the U.S.-led mission to overthrow Saddam Hussein as ruler of Iraq. It was around 9 p.m. Baghdad time when the bombs started falling. To end the regime of Saddam Hussein by striking with force on a scope and scale that makes clear to Iraqis that he and his regime are finished. Dubbed shock and awe, the relentless aerial assault set the stage for a massive month-long ground invasion. A relic of that military operation now sits half-submerged in southern Iraq, a rusting reminder of the man who ruled and robbed the country for three decades. Here's CTV's chief international correspondent, Paul Workman. 
It's not so much the fishing that attracts people to this particular spot on the Basra waterfront. More the sight of a half-sunken yacht eternally rusting away, left for scrap where it was bombed 20 years ago. I can't believe this belonged to Saddam, says fisherman Hussein Sabahi. Amazed and perhaps still a little daunted by the former Iraqi dictator and his once lavish boat. During Saddam's time, we dreamed of seeing inside it, he says, but nobody could come close, and now the world has changed. Al Mansur, the name still clear above the waterline, in English, the victor, looted and left for salvage long ago. 121 luxurious meters with a crew of 65 and seating for 200 dinner guests. Moved to Basra for safekeeping, only to be hit by American warplanes a week after the invasion was launched. If Hussein Sabahi couldn't get close before, he can climb all over it now, and often does for picnics with his sons. Other people come to take photos, he says. It would be better if they could move it and turn it into a museum. It took three years to hunt down, prosecute, and hang Saddam Hussein. His bombed-out yacht, though, lives on as a stark and rusting symbol of Iraq's past and a place to go fishing. Paul Workman, CTV News, London. Still ahead, all eyes on Monet. And he's part of this much wider network that um, was, you know, kind of essential for Monet's success. The art exhibit taking a look at the work and the true influence behind the French painter. In the UK, it is Mother's Day and the first one for King Charles III without his mom, the late queen. In this touching tribute, the royal family posted pictures of their mothers. One shows Queen Elizabeth holding baby Charles in her lap. The other is of Queen Consort Camilla with her mother and a message to all mothers everywhere. We are thinking of you and wishing you a special Mother's Day. A groundbreaking art exhibit in Paris is shining a spotlight, not only on the works of Claude Monet, but also on the influence of his often overlooked older brother. Here's CTV's Vanessa Lee. The works of Claude Monet are exquisite and unmistakable. He is widely considered to be the founder of Impressionism. One tends to think of Monet as being, you know, making it all by himself. But he relied on, uh, on, the, on a network of collectors, supporters, dealers. Among his biggest supporters, his older brother Léon. It took years for curator Géraldine Lefebvre to uncover the elder Monet's influence on the painter. Now the focus of a new exhibition at the Musée du Luxembourg. On display for the very first time, this sketchbook started by Claude when he was just 15 years old, that Léon later bought at auction. These first drawings are very high quality and they are very precise. And Léo Monet saw that at the beginning he understood that um, his brother will become a great artist. The brothers shared a passion for color. Léon bought Claude's paintings at a time when nobody else did. Léon also played, played a crucial role in um, buying back works by, by Claude Monet, um, giving an impression that you know, his, his work was actually quite popular. Also featured in this never-seen-before collection, this portrait of Léon by Claude in 1874, an illustration of their affectionate bond. Claude Monet gave uh, this uh, portrait to his brother, but Léon Monet didn't accept it. Uh, he didn't like it. Sadly, their relationship fell apart later in life. Little did either of them know how precious these paintings and pastels would be, masterpieces that kick-started a movement. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. Well, a master of his craft, actor-comedian Adam Sandler, received comedy's most prestigious honor, the Mark Twain Prize for American Humor. <laughs> he's laughing, he's having a good time, good for you. Sandler has entertained audiences largely through slapstick comedy and playing 
overgrown man-child characters. Sandler has now been in show business for more than 30 years. And a surprising display lit up the night sky in Northern California. What is that? Mysterious glowing objects were seen on Friday night and took the internet by storm. But scientists say they were just pieces of burning space junk from the International Space Station that posed no danger to anyone on the ground. After the break, another sight to behold. We're not unaware, that's just not everybody's cup of tea. How an unforeseen pooch pawed their way to the top. We leave you tonight with a wonderful rags to riches story. Peggy the Pooch is lapping up all the fuss and attention after picking up a rather unflattering accolade. CTV's Melanie Nagy on how every dog has its day. Her tongue's constantly hanging out. What do you see when you look at this pooch named Peggy? Is it her permanently dangling tongue or her pink skin that's devoid of fur? We're not unaware that she's not everybody's cup of tea. Holly Middleton from the UK's East Yorkshire owns the mixed breed pug. I'd walk down the street with her and you'd see people look at her and maybe whisper to their friends. Only whispers and stares from strangers. That's the way it was until she won a popular but unconventional contest. Now she's sort of been on telly a little bit and um, people want to come up, they want to have selfies with her. Five-year-old Peggy was recently crowned Britain's ugliest dog. Combination of hairlessness and ugliness and also the, the drool, like the tongue hanging out. It was more of like the complete package uh, in a sense. Putting your dog in a contest that labels them bad looking doesn't sound all that nice. But Middleton says it was an opportunity to spark a conversation. I think she's really cute. I don't think she's ugly. And a lot of people, when they meet her, they're like, oh, actually, she's really, she's really cute looking. You see, when Middleton looks at Peggy, she sees a loving companion. She also sees a dog that loves to devour its dinner. Sniff out new scents and get pampered at the salon. I just think you're used to dogs looking a certain way. And that's the thing about Peggy. She pushes you to look beyond appearances. She's lovely, as like personality-wise, she is, she's amazing. A beauty of a dog, teaching people a lesson that it's okay to be different. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Vancouver. Every dog is cute in their own way, right? That's it for us tonight. I'm John Benavelli Rao. For Sandy and all the rest of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Omar will be here tomorrow. Have a good night and a great week. CTV National News, Canada's number one newscast.